um, you guys, there is, a, there is something remarkable happening in Salt Lake City, and it has actually flown under my radar until, uh, until about a month ago. Um, our, next, our next guest will be, will be speaking in depth about that. Uh, it's pretty incredible uh, that this person is actually here with us, Joseph Grenny. Um, he's, an, he's an example of a Latter-day Saint that is just doing incredible things in the world. Um, I'll give you a, a, quick, uh, a quick bio of his. Um, he's a lifelong student of social science whose writings are references in major universities around the world. He is a New York Times best-selling author of eight books, including Crucial Conversations, Influencer, Crucial Accountability, and Change Anything. His books are available in over 30 languages and have sold over six million copies. Uh, what he is doing now in Salt Lake City is truly incredible. Um, Bill and Susan and Aubrey and I had a chance to visit uh, jo with Joseph about, like I said, about a month ago, and our, our jaws were on the floor the entire time. Uh, what he's done, along with, along with his partners, is give people that are struggling with chronic homelessness, crime, and addiction a real path forward, uh, a way that is unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, and it, we were actually able to, the Other Side Academy is a school completely free of charge for people struggling with this, these issues. And in the brief uh, interactions that I had with these students, it has truly changed their lives. And the way that, that Joseph and his partners have imagined this is truly incredible. So I am very happy to welcome to the stage Joseph Grenny. Well, good afternoon. Maybe not. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but uh, just transitioning to the current topic, I'll just reveal a couple of things. First of all, I am a committed stage two <laughs> that has a vision of stage three, but vacations in stage one. So I don't know about you, <laughs> but that's me. So um, I have a story I want to share this afternoon. We, my wife and I, have been the reluctant recipients of, uh, of productive suffering, probably like many of you. There are a few things that, that I know. There are many things I believe, but just a handful that I absolutely know. They're the spiritual physics of my life, and that's some of what I hope to leave with you today. The story I'd like to share is one of both revelation and redemption, uh, both about me. One of the things I know is this that the greatest evidence that I'm aware of of God's love for all of us is the things that he quietly sets in motion, sometimes many years in advance, to save us when we're ready. And that's the story I'd like to share today. For those of you, any of you familiar with the Other Side Academy? Raise your hand. Look at that. Lots of friends. Awesome. Good to have you here. For those of you that don't know, I think of the Other Side Academy as Zion with a lot of F-bombs. <laughs> and, I, and I mean both of those things. For any of you that have visited the Other Side Academy, it's a sacred space. It's a wonderful place. They could blindfold you and walk you in, and you would feel something. You, were knowing, you would know you were in a place where important things were happening. Some of the evidences of what's happening there are things like this. This is a picture that, as you'll understand shortly, nobody could have conceived of ever being taken just a number of years ago. It happened two weeks ago, one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, and you're about to appreciate how it happened. All of the women standing in this picture should be incarcerated right now. And yet that, yet that picture occurred. And how it occurred, I think, is instructive to all of us. Will help us appreciate and understand a little bit more about how God does his work. So this picture here is the student body of the Other Side Academy about a year or so ago. In front of you are about 140 folks. Collectively, before they got to the Other Side Academy, they were facing about uh, 700 years of incarceration. So most had been arrested again. Uh, they've been arrested an average of 25 times. If they had served their outstanding sentences, again, the public purse would have been at an expense of about 700 years. And that was on top of about an average of 10 years of incarceration prior to them coming. And yet there they are. So I want you to meet some of our students before they become. The trajectory of the lives I'm about to share, you would have never predicted could have ever intersected with mine. I didn't anticipate it. But here you got one, here's another, 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 another. These are they, just as they're arriving at the Other Side Academy. 
So one of these people was living under a bridge in Salt Lake City from age three to about age 11 and then riding trains with mom, who was a sex worker, for about the next four years. Mom introduced this person to meth when they were seven years old just so they'd have the energy to take care of the children that she was uh, giving birth to and not caring for herself. Another was on an interstate crime spree and finally landed in Utah, was on their way to prison in our state. Another had been a, a veteran of the Navy, sort of. Uh, they were kicked out, dishonorably discharged, hoped that the Navy would transform their life, but instead brought all their bad habits with them and eventually ended up on their way to prison as well. Another had been an aspiring gang member, was uh, trying to get more street cred with the gang by stabbing a homeless person. That was at least one of the charges that they were up on. And another was, was living on the streets of Salt Lake City, shooting heroin for 20 years prior to, come, prior to coming to the Other Side Academy, describing what she calls using her body as an ATM. Now, again, the odds that my life and theirs would have intersected were about zero, except for some remarkable things about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that it was your job to try to take 140 felons, put them into a home, and try to do something productive. Because as you just heard, nobody pays to come. There's no insurance, no government reimbursement. The house has to support itself. When Joseph Smith ran for president, one of his platform ideas was close all the prisons and turn them into schools. So imagine that he's president, this just happened, and you're in charge of one of the schools. You got 140 of them. So here's your typical student. I want you to understand a little bit about their profile. Some of you are entrepreneurs. What kind of a business would you start if you needed to generate income with these 140 students? When I went to jail the first time where I was fighting a case that I, when I was looking at going to prison, it was for a large amount of methamphetamine and firearms, and the end result was two years. I got out for 60 days after that term, got in trouble again for the same exact thing, and went back to prison for five more years. Got out another two months, went back to prison for six years, got out after that term, and went back to prison for 10 years. And soon after that term, I had gotten in trouble again, only this time I was looking at 29 years, which in essence would have been the rest of my life. All right, so those are your students. What are you going to do? What kind of a business? So we put our heads together when we started, and we thought, well, let's play to our strengths. One of the things our students are good at is going into people's homes and moving their valuables. <laughs> so let's start a moving company. When we first started, we moved into the Armstrong Mansion at the corner of 7th East and 1st South in downtown Salt Lake City, a nice neighborhood. You would have thought the neighbors would have been terrified to know that soon there would be 140 criminals living next door to them. But we only brought them in one criminal at a time. <laughs> so nobody knew. Now we were told, I don't know that this is true, but for some reason we were spiritually attracted to this home and heard later that some believe that this was a domicile for apostles on the lamb during the po po polygamy raids. So it had a history of criminals in the house. When students first arrive, the unique thing about our community is it's not about sitting down and, and getting therapized. It's not about sitting in a group and having somebody diagnose your problems. Our assumption is that the problem our students have is learning to live in a healthy community. And the best way to learn to do that is to practice living in a healthy community. So from day one when you're accepted, you're going to help clean things up. You're going to take care of the house. You're going to contribute. You're going to help run the social enterprises. You'll see the transformation that's taken place. This was our backyard when we arrived. This is what it looks like today. The crime rate was high because there were trap houses and uh, flop houses in the backyard, all of them torn down. The stumps pulled up, one, uh, one uh, pick at a time. These were the two houses adjacent to us. Eventually, we were able to acquire them. And the students, again, through their own industry, turned them into this. This became the meeting home for our students until just a few months ago, where all of our meals were cooked and our family meals are served. So the first business, as I suggested, was a moving company. When we went to market and said, we're a bunch of felons and we wanted to come into your house and move your valuables, the market was reluctantly nervous. But my guess is that there are some here who have hired the other side movers. Can I get a shout out about your experience? <clears throat> We need more customers, apparently. So, <laughs> After a few months of, of posting impressive reviews, if you look online and you just read the re reviews, you'd think you, would re you were reading something that people who had been to a Four Seasons spa are recording. 
They'll talk about professionalism and kindness and tenderness and care and honesty and integrity. And the reputation grew so much that the enterprise grew. Today we do 300 moves a month. One of the people who's pictured I showed you, thank you, yes, it's a, quite an achievement. One of the pictures I showed you just a little while ago is one of the students who now runs the moving company. Instead of trying to aspire for uh, elevated status in a gang, he's running a $3 million business. We then recognized there was an adjacency opportunity. We were getting lots of donated goods from people on move, so we decided to start a thrift boutique. We got a beat up old space in Murray on State Street and turned it into this. Again, the students did the vast majority, if not all, of the work there. We now have two of these run entirely also by the students. This is a remarkable event. In the last seven years that the Other Side Academy has been in existence, I've seen things that most of us would think are impossible to have happen. Two of these women are longtime felons. One of them is my wife. I want you to guess which is which. <laughs> now, the one in the middle is my, my wonderful wife, partner in starting the Other Side Academy. The two outside of her would be in prison right now serving lengthy sentences, but instead in this picture, they're at the Grand America Hotel. They were invited with the business elite of Utah because they were a finalist for an entrepreneurship award. And here I got to sit in the Grand America Hotel with 600 of the best and brightest of Utah's business community with a bunch of felons from the Other Side Academy. And then this happened. And the award goes to... Dave DeRoche. <laughs> Can you imagine how life-changing that is? That for the first time, you're not graduating from some class or workshop. What you're doing is you're making a difference in the world that other people respect. You're part of a community that you never thought you'd be worthy of being a part of. These are transformational moments. So here's how you arrive at the Other Side Academy. There's one of two ways. Either you write a letter from jail if you've been recently arrested and you're up on new charges, one of our folks, just an older peer in the house, will show up and interview you if you're accepted. Then you show up at the house and you sit on the bench. The bench is a portal, it's a symbol for us, it's a ritual. You may sit there for a few hours to demonstrate your commitment to honoring what the house is about. Across from you as you sit on the bench are going to be the commitments that we keep in the house. Take a look at some of them. Some of the words may be familiar, some may be unfamiliar. Things like impeccable honesty, act as if. You know, this really is uh, what, what JFF was just teaching us about getting to stage two. It's learning social rules, learning to, to just t subordinate your emotions and your needs for a moment and care for the needs of other people. That's what you're committing to. You'll be given a robust interview by some of the other peers in the house, and if they believe you're sincere about changing your life, you're in. You commit to stay for two and a half years. One of the most remarkable things is these people who have been impulsive, greedy, racist, violent, narcissistic for sometimes decades. After two and a half years, two-thirds of the students ask to stay a third year. They want to stay, long, stay longer. We recently had a group of LDS missionaries come for a tour. And at the end, I had students on this side of the academy and missionaries on this side. And I looked at the missionaries, and I looked at the students, and it struck me all of a sudden. I said, I said, elders, I want you to understand something. I want you to appreciate something. I said, if your mission president gathered the whole mission tomorrow and said, good news, President Nelson says that if you want to stay a third year, you can. I said, how many of the missionaries do you think would raise their hand and sign up for a third year? And they looked at the ground and shuffled their feet, and, and that was the answer to the question. It really put into perspective the remarkable progress that these students make to choose to subject themselves to limitations on their freedoms for a greater period of time because they come to love other people, because they want to serve and take care of them. I put this up there because one of the brags at the Other Side Academy is in seven years of operation, we haven't had a single dirty drug test. These are longtime heroin and meth addicts, not a single dirty drug test. In my first week at the Other Side Academy, I sat in a group feedback session, and on my right hand was a white member of the, uh, uh, of the Aryan Brotherhood with a big swastika tattoo on his hand. On the left was a black member of the Other Side Academy. 
who had tattoos indicating his affiliation with the Crips. And here they live in the same house. We haven't had a single act of violence in seven years either. We have men and women living in the house, and I thought it would be Peyton Place, or whatever the updated version of that is uh, today, in no time. It is one of, in fact, I would argue that the Other Side Academy is more chaste and more sober than a BYU dorm. <laughs> so, that's the background. So I want to share with you just a little bit about my journey to the Other Side Academy as well. So these were our kids, five of the six when they were little. Um, our goal was to be the brochure family. You know, we thought we're going to hold family home evening and doggone it, these kids are going to grow up, go on missions, go to BYU. We had the whole plan laid out. We lived in a great neighborhood in Orem with wonderful neighbors. We were part of a terrific church community. Our children had terrific leaders. They had spiritual experiences growing up. And so the shock was when later on in life, two of our boys, who we expected were going to be part of that stalwart brochure experience, ended up in mugshots. So on the left is our son Seth, on the right is Samuel. Both of them got into drugs, started down a, down a very dark path, and incredibly self-destructive behavior, and this went on for, for over a decade. It was a horrible experience, and I won't torture you with all of it, but this was one of the particularly low points. I got a call that my precious son had overdosed, and sitting next to him in the hospital and watching my son go through this as his organs shut down and as the doctor said his chances of survival are fairly low. I thought, dear God, how did we get here? It was maddening. To me, there was no more searing agony in life than being completely powerless while witnessing the optional suffering of somebody that I love having absolutely no capacity to intervene. Over time, I began to start to believe in a God that must be equally miserable like me. I thought, if it's this bad with two boys doing this, what would it be like if you had six out of your seven billion children on the planet at any particular time doing horrible things, destroying their lives, limiting themselves? What would it be like? How do you hold that? And I started to realize that God himself would go mad if he didn't have a way out of that problem. And then I began to understand something that got me out of that misery. I began to appreciate that the solution, the only escape from it, was a better understanding of atonement. I've come to believe that I understood the atonement far too small. I think at its smallest, we think it's about being forgiven of sins. A little larger, and we think it's about changing our character. But you and I have the opportunity to understand that it's way bigger than that. President Nelson says that the gathering of Israel is the most important work taking place on the earth, and that is atonement work. Atonement work is about sealing relationships. We understand that exaltation is collective, not individual. And what that helped me start to appreciate is that the path to peace, the path to hope, the path to a sense of power is that when an individual that you are concerned with wants nothing from you, what you do is you get involved in collective atonement. I came to understand what, what later I found in the scriptures, what I'll, I'll call the nethermost principle. You'll remember in Jacob chapter 5 where we have this lengthy parable, which I think is rich with, with principles for helping us deal with optional despair in our lives. It says at one point that the Lord of the vineyard said, it grieves me that I should lose this tree. I knew that word grief. I understood what it meant. And then it says an interesting thing. The Lord of the vineyard went his way in the nethermost part of the vineyard. What I came to understand is that when the tree you love most isn't having it, go to the nethermost part. Work somewhere else. There's always work to do. The misery and the hardship we have in our lives, the specific hardships we have, are designed to create generalized abilities in us. And those generalized abilities are about the gathering of Israel. They're about serving others who suffer similar afflictions, not just the ones that aren't having the, the help that you, was, you were hoping that they would receive. So how does that affect us? In 2005, this is where they were. So Tiffany, Diego, and Gregory, and Matthew, and Tori, this is the situation their lives were in, and this is what my life was about. As their life was on a trajectory taking them to hell, 
I felt an over, overwhelming impression from God that it was time to write a book I'd prepared for for about 10 years. The book was about influence. It was about how you create systemic change, rapid, profound, sustainable behavior change. We charted a study that took us all across the world studying how you influence the behavior of large populations to stop pandemics, to stop violence, to stop a whole host of social problems. But eventually we wanted to study criminal recidivism as part of this book. And I went to my mentor, a guy by the name of Albert Bandura, a renowned psychologist at Stanford, and said, who's doing the best work on this? He said, this will be easy. You don't have to go to Ethiopia. You don't have to go to Korea. He said, just drive up the coast to a place called Delancey Street. In 2005, as Tiffany and Gregory and Tori were on their path, this is where I went. And I met a woman named Mimi Silbert. Now, if you've never heard about Delancey Street, you've probably driven by it if you've been to San Francisco. This 300,000 square foot facility was built entirely by convicts, staffed by convicts. It has been a transformational place for tens of thousands of people that have been there since the 1970s. And as I learned about this Zion community with a lot of F-bombs, what I came to appreciate is that the spirit is there in greater intensity than most any place I'd ever experienced. That lives were being changed, that hearts were being changed there. And again, nobody pays. It costs nothing. It's supporting itself. It's doing it the way Brigham Young would have done it, which I thought was absolutely incredible, and yet the world didn't know about it. So I kept nagging and nagging and nagging Mimi and saying, why isn't this spreading? Why isn't it out there? Why are there only a couple of campuses in the world? And then I forgot about it, published the book, and moved on with my life. And then my son started to go to jail. Now, I'm just going to tell you one little thread of this story. There are so many miracles that are part of this, that were part of Tori, that were part of Gregory, that were part of Matthew and others' transformations, because God set things in motion long in advance to save them when they were ready. One of those things he set in motion was he had a guy who wrote a book about influence who knew Mimi Silbert have a son that went to jail. And he was in jail for a year-long sentence. He called himself a prisoner of conscience because he believed that it should be legal to do illegal drugs. And so he wasn't going to plead to any charges. He was going to take his time and do it uh, just like Nelson Mandela would. What a brave man. And in jail, because he's pretty smart, he learned the rules, and pretty soon he was in a trust system that let him work off premises. But he started failing drug tests. Turns out he's got a lot of fatty tissue, so the marijuana stayed in him a little bit longer, and he was flunking drug tests. So he thought it was a failure that he got thrown back into general population the day that Zach Fawcett arrived. Zach Fawcett, this is his first arrest picture from back in uh, his early years when he was 18 years old. If you want to see the investment in our criminal justice system and the dividends it pays, Here's his second arrest picture, here's his third, and here's the one that was taken as he was arrested for the last time. He was in Pleasant Grove, Utah with a car full of meth, guns, and forged documents. The police lit up behind him and went on a high-speed chase. He knew he'd be incarcerated for a very long time and he wasn't having it. He wanted the cops to kill him. So he tried to provoke them into killing him, they didn't, they popped his tires, they tased him, they took him into the jail, and it took him two days to wake up in the cell with my son. He had in that cell what I'd refer to as a father of Lamoni experience. He woke up and thought, this is it. This is the end of my life. They've got me for 30 years. When all of his cellmates were gone one afternoon, he fell on his knees and he said, God, if you're up there, now's the time to let me know. He told me later that he felt this overwhelming feeling that there was a God, that God knew who he is, and that God loved him. And he became a self-improvement junkie. He started asking the Muslims about Islam. He started asking the Catholics about Catholicism. And then he had this reluctant missionary in his cell named Samuel, my son. He starts asking him about the church of Jesus Christ. And Samuel knows the answers, doesn't believe him, but starts answering. And Zach is intrigued. He starts reading the Book of Mormon. And finally, he starts reading some of my books. He reads Crucial Conversations, and then he reads Influencer. And in Influencer, he reads about Delancey Street. And something lights up in him. He says, that's it. That's what I need. That book was written for that moment, for that moment when Zach Fawcett would be in that jail cell. And one day, he says to Samuel, when you talk to your dad, would you ask him if when I complete my sentence, he'd help me go to Delancey Street? Because if I just walk out, I'll do what I did before. So I have this bizarre conversation on a video visit with Samuel in jail. And Samuel says, so Zach's asking if when he finishes his sentence in 25 years, you'd help him get to Delancey Street. 
And I glibly, kind of snotty, said, well, I don't think I'm busy that day, so sure, you know, <laughs> happy to do it. And I hung up the phone, and I have never felt reproved by the Spirit more intensely than in that moment. There was this response that said, that wasn't just the wrong answer, that was an irreverent answer. And so I picked up the phone. It just so happened that my brother-in-law was the county attorney. God sets things in motion, sometimes many years in advance, so that he can save us when we're ready. Six years earlier, Jeff had run for county attorney. I'd helped with his campaign because I believed we needed change, but now he was in office and we had a really good, strong relationship. So I called Jeff. And I said, Jeff, would you ever send somebody to Delancey Street? He said, yeah, absolutely. We'd think about it. And I said, well, you got a case right now, Zach Fawcett. Would you do that? And he said, no. He said, come on. He says, if it's a live case, it's going to move through the system far faster. This is going to take forever to get judges and prosecutors and public defenders and everybody on board. We're going to have to meet and con convince, persuade, and it's going to be a years-long process. I thought I'd done my job, and I hung up the phone. The Spirit said again, wrong answer. So I picked the phone back up, and I said, Jeff, how about if we just try one guy? And if we fail, we fail. He said, all right. He calls me back a week later. And he said, I can't believe it. They all said yes. Now, I'll just tell you one of the miracles in that yes. It was this person. This is Christine Scott. So Jeff is the county attorney. He walks into the prosecutor's office who's been assigned the case. And he says, Christine, you've got a case for Zach Fawcett. He said her shoulders stiffen. He said, I'm just wondering if you would consider an alternative to incarceration, helping him go to Delancey Street in California for a couple of years. Her face went white. He could tell that she was not having it, and he said, your case, you do what you need to do, and he walked out of the room. Christine told me later that as the door swung shut, she had this overwhelming feeling that that was the wrong answer. What you need to know about Christine was that she had been a police officer 15 years before and had arrested Zach Fawcett. She said he was so violent and out of control that it was the first time she drew her weapon and thought she might need to kill somebody. She said when she became a prosecutor, the first time she got a Zach Fawcett case, she licked her lips because she thought, I can throw this dirt bag away just where he belongs. And every time a Zach Fawcett case came up, she raised her hand. This time she had so many felonies, she thought, I am going to do the best public good I have ever done. I'm going to incarcerate him for the rest of his useful life. And then Jeff Buman walks into her office, and she said, I felt this overwhelming feeling. So I drove out to the jail and I visited with him. And over the next few months, she became his advocate. She became his friend. And the process was protracted. It turns out, who would have known that California doesn't want us sending all our criminals to them? <laughs> so it was quite a negotiation to be able to get what's called an interstate compact, to be able to send him over there. He grew so discouraged at one point that he was about to give up. And this sacred moment happened. And here's how the nethermost principle works. When the tree that you want to serve isn't having it, you serve others. You take the generalized abilities that God has given you by dealing with your hardships, and you serve where you can serve, because atonement work is atonement work. The gathering is the gathering. And so that's what we did. We're helping Zach. And what happened that day in that jail cell is just mind-boggling to me. As Zach said, I'm about to give up, my son, who had no faith in Jesus Christ, said, tomorrow's fast Sunday. How about if we fast? And one after another, the eight men in that pod said, I'll fast too. Can you imagine the picture of eight men in orange jumpsuits kneeling down on a Sunday morning and starting their fast and then ending it on Sunday evening and then two weeks later getting word that his way had been cleared to go to Delancey Street? Well, the vision expanded. And it wasn't just Zach, it was a few others. And then one day the instruction came from Father in Heaven that said, all right, I've helped you understand how the process works. Now it's your job to get this started here. Well, I had no clue how to do it, so I just called a bunch of people and said, let's go out to Delancey Street and check it out. We got the, the state attorney general, we got the, the, the head of adult probation and parole and a variety of other officials. We went out to Delancey Street and everybody learned and at the end everybody kumbaya and said, this is terrific, we need one of these in Utah. And then I turned to Delancey Street and said, okay, you gonna help us out? Because I don't know how to run this, we need some of your graduates, will you help us out? They said, absolutely. 
Week after week after week, no help came, and thank heaven it didn't, because that wasn't who God wanted to have run this. After three or four months, I was despairing, and one day in prayer, I got this inspiration that maybe LinkedIn would have it. Who'd have thought? We went on LinkedIn, and I thought, maybe there are people on LinkedIn that admit that they're graduates of Delancey Street. You know, I was a felon, and uh, here's where I went, changed my life. So we did a search, and it turned out there were 50 people. The top of the list was a woman by the name of Charlotte Harper. She's the one in the back in the green sweater. She had been there for 38 years. I called her up and said, we need to do something like this in Utah. Will you come out? She met with us for two days. At the end of the second day, I tenderly asked her, would you move out here? She said, nah, I've, I've done my time. 38 years, she said, I'm moving on with my life. Got family in Oakland. And I said, but do you know anybody? She hung her head and smiled, and she said, funny thing. She said, two days ago, I got a call from a guy named Dave DeRocher, one of the most remarkable leaders I worked with at, the, at Delancey Street. And he said, I've been out for two years, and, but my soul is empty. I need to get back into saving lives. Have you heard of anything? She said, these guys from Provo called us. <laughs> and she said, in two days when I know if they're not insane, I'll call you back. <laughs> she called him. We flew to Los Angeles. We met with him at a steakhouse in, uh, uh, in, at the LA Live area. And if you've ever had an experience of absolutely knowing before someone opens their mouth that they're the person that God prepared, that was precisely what happened with Dave. I walked up to Fleming's, and there was a guy standing outside with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth. And I realized we didn't have pictures of each other. This was like a blind date, you know. How are we going to know who's Dave here? And the guy's leaning and slouching, and I walked up to him and in a silent prayer said, Please, God, don't let it be him. <laughs> I said, Dave? He goes, No, Tony. And I said, Thank you. <laughs> I walked inside and seated on the bench just in the waiting area there, ramrod straight with a white shirt and tie is Dave DeRocher. Again, one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. We started talking to friends and family, trying to raise the funds we'd need to purchase the building so that we could move in and wouldn't be saddled with debt. Literally, if you look at the dates, this is now just about months into the process. Just months. The timeline is staggering when you look at it. Within nine months, here we are with a home, with a wonderful team of Delancey graduates, with Alan and Lola and Dave here, who moved into the house and said, bring it on. Let's start saving lives. This is where it starts. It starts on the bench. The bench arrived September 1st, 2015, and today we have 140 students who are fighting harder to save their lives than most of us will ever properly appreciate it. Kind of miraculously, this is a picture from Denver. So some of our graduates grew up into the house and moved to Denver to open a second campus. There are now five campuses doing the same thing we do as a consequence of those wheels that were set in motion just years ago. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, friends, I know this to be true. God occasionally just pulls back the curtain a little bit to say, see what I'm doing here? Can you see what I'm doing? Most of the time, we don't get to see it. But every once in a while, he gives us a little glimpse. And these are some of the glimpses of those miracles. This is Christmas at the Other Side Academy. If you haven't experienced it there, you don't know Christmas. Imagine 140 people in a massive circle, 1,100 presents in the middle of the room. And you put a little pile of gifts in front of a woman who's never had a sober Christmas in her life who was abused and neglected and now has some socks and some shoes and a couple of other really small gifts and opens them up and melts into tears. Before we open the gifts, I always ask a question. In a crowd about the size of this section here, I'll say, raise your hand if you know with absolute certainty that God performed miracles to get you here. And 80% of the hands will go up. I'm confident the other 20% are true too, but just don't know it. This is one. I one day appeared in court. Next to me was Dave DeRocher, who you saw earlier, longtime criminal and felon. He and I are there because we're hoping to get Sean to the Other Side Academy. The judge looks at this stack of felonies that Sean has committed and says, I just can't see my way clear to turning you out again and not incarcerating you after all these things that you've done. I just don't think it can happen. The public defender stands up and says, but you need to know about the Other Side Academy. It works. And the judge shakes his head. 
And then the prosecutor stands up and says, I've been there. We're supportive of this. The state is supportive of this. Sean is exactly the kind of person that would benefit here. And the judge looks at the felonies and looks at Sean and looks at the felonies and looks at Sean. And then just like we imagine the judgment bar to be, the prosecutor says, we have representatives of the other side academy here. Would it be okay if one of them spoke? Dave stands up next to Sean. He's the spitting image of Sean, just 15 years older. Same build, same tattoos, same history, same incarceration, and the judge can see that all I've got here is somebody with 10 years added to them after going to a place like the Other Side Academy. The judge said, you have permission to go. We all need a savior at times to speak on our behalf, and the fact that he earned his bona fides by being here, by suffering as we did, is what gives him the credibility and the power to change lives. Lisa here had been stealing drugs from her cancer-afflicted mother, her own pain medication, because she wanted to feed her own addiction. She violated her relationships with so many family members that finally she'd burned the bridges and they kicked her out. She had $4.80 in her pocket, went to a Starbucks, and bought her last cup of coffee before she was homeless. She said as she finished her cup of coffee, she leaned her head down and she said the first prayer in years. She said, please, God. I'll do homelessness if I have to, but if there's another way. Her eyes lifted up, and there was a sheet of paper on the bulletin board, a thank you note from the Other Side Academy for the coffee that Starbucks had donated. She said she felt summoned to it, grabbed it, called the number. Today she's a realtor in Salt Lake City. <laughs> Finally, Michael. Michael decided to kill himself by driving cross-country from Philadelphia all the way to the other coast, wanted to see some of the mountains in, in Oregon before he died. He went as far out in wintertime as he could until his car was stuck in the snow and there was no way out. After two days of being cold and facing starvation, he changed his mind but had no options available. He started to pray. He started to hope, but knew that if he got out and started walking, he would die of, uh, 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 die of frost. Well, over the next two days, he continued to pray. The next morning, a man walks up in snowshoes from 10 miles away, just happened to be out on his snowmobile. This man happened to take him back to his house. This man happened to be a graduate of Delancey Street. This man happened to know Dave DeRocher in Salt Lake City, who had a place just like Delancey Street. Two days later, he flies in, and this is him today. My friends, I know that when the tree that we can't help, the tree that wants no help from us, is refusing that help, what Heavenly Father hopes that we do is take the generalized abilities we've got and start getting involved in atonement work and just gathering the family of Jesus Christ and the family of God. I've seen what happens when that occurs. This is Tiffany today. Tiffany works at the Other Side Academy and goes into the same jails that she inhabited to bring women home and help them change their lives. This is Diego, who now runs the moving company. This is Matthew, who I just uh, married two years ago to another graduate of the Other Side Academy, who now runs a storage business for the Other Side Academy. This is Greg. Can you see the story of his life on his face? I don't even need to tell you the particulars. This is Greg as he left to Denver to help open a second campus of the Other Side Academy. And this is Tori when she arrived. Couldn't make eye contact, couldn't complete a sentence. And this is Tori today who runs the women's program. Last thing I want to share is just why it works. Because I think this is, this is informative for us as we try to build a community of saints as well. I've come to discover that the key to human change is two things. It's truth and it's love. It's truth and it's love, and we suck at doing both. We tend to think that you can just do love without truth or you can just do truth without love. You know, love without truth is, is just aggression. Truth without love is permission. But truth and love is transformational, absolute unvarnished truth. The capacity to be honest, emotionally honest with each other is at the heart of what we do at the Other Side Academy. This is our student as they arrive. This is Austin when he's sitting on the bench, and you can see the work that needs to be done there. 
The most important thing we do in addition to running our community is tell each other the truth. Everyone in the house is responsible for correcting anyone. This is a guy on the left who's correcting a big thug on the right as he's arriving and breaking the rules, probably stole something in the house or what have you. And then twice a week, tonight at 7.30, downtown Salt Lake City, the students will sit in groups of 20, and they'll just tell each other the truth. What have I seen in you? What do you need to work on? They'll give feedback. And it's pretty, pretty clear. It's pretty direct. Let me give you an example. This is Greg, who right before this stole a coat. He saw a coat that he liked in the, uh, in the clothing area, and he grabbed it and hoped that he could get away with that. When it turned out somebody noticed it missing, he blamed somebody else. This is what the feedback sounded like that night. I want you to notice when the shift happens. Watch when the shift occurs and when Greg takes it in, and you'll see the key to everything we do at the academy. You know when we went down there what happened, and I trust you, and this is the kind of shit you give me in return, you throw me under the bus, I get called in the quorum and question my integrity that I've been working on so hard and you just blow it right there. Now I have to prove to the staff and everyone that I didn't. You know what, Greg is that you won't listen to what he's bringing you, man. He cares about you, we all care about you, and you're sitting over there, oh, I didn't do that, I don't remember that. You're right. Hey, Russell, you're right, man. I, 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 I'm sorry, man. I did that. Did you see the moment? I care about you. We love you. The capacity in one room, in one sentence, to string together. There are the, the most creative uses of the F word I've ever imagined. <laughs> it turns out it's an adjective, a verb, a direct object, a preposition. It's everything. <laughs> to be able to string all of that together and express love at the same moment is the magic of that place. To be able to have unvarnished truth with love at the same time. And it's what we stink at in our communities. We sit in church so often, and we're next to somebody who's suffering just like us. But we don't talk about it. We don't confront it. We're afraid to make waves. We think it's respectful to be dishonest, to pretend that we don't know things. And brothers and sisters, we're breaking hearts and we're ruining lives in the process. The reason the Other Side Academy is so... The reason this place is so profoundly effective, the reason the spirit you feel there is so intense and strong is because it's a house of truth, but also a house of love. People won't give up, but they won't give in. And nobody, in, in, in seven years, we've kicked out six people. We'll put up with you forever, but you're also going to hear about it every single day <laughs> until you change. Just like this. In fact, our main home is called the Michelangelo because that's where the work is done. Our job is to remove the part that isn't the masterpiece. And that's what your brothers and sisters do for you because they see the stone that doesn't belong. And they can see the truth in you better than you can sometimes. And it's that conversation, it's that truth that sometimes violently removes and exposes some of those things that are not supposed to be you. In conclusion, here are some of the miracles that happened. This was amazing to me. So a group called Ally Bank has fallen in love with the Other Side Academy and helped with some of our capital projects. They came one day and they said, our bank regulators are going to be here and we'd love to let them know what we're doing socially in the community. So they said, would some of your students come and talk to them? So here we've got a student standing in front of these bank regulators. And after telling them about the Other Side Academy, one of the bank regulators said, well, yeah, but of course, you know, you guys aren't doing like any major crimes, are you? <laughs> our students tell the truth. And so I said, what were the felonies you were convicted or you were accused of before you came? The one who was addressing him at the moment said, bank robbery. <laughs> there was an awkward silence, <laughs> followed by a round of applause. <laughs> this to me is absolute beauty. This is Zion. This is heaven. This is the celestial kingdom. This is Leticia, who is a longtime gang member and junkie in downtown Salt Lake City. She's giving a lecture on accountability to the South Salt Lake Police Department.
After some of the, the, the racial tension that had happened, as we saw the injustices that happened in some police departments, they took a look at themselves and they said, we're not really good at calling each other out on things. You guys are kind of good at this. So where did they go? They go to a bunch of criminals to learn about how to address and be honest with each other about problems and weaknesses. So here's Letitia standing in the front. I want you to look at the far left. There's a bald police officer, Lieutenant Anderson, who's sitting on the front row and he's smiling because he recognizes her. He had arrested her multiple times. And he came up to her with tears in his eyes afterward and said, there were so many times when you were in the back of my squad car and I thought, Leticia, darn it, you were meant for better things than this. And now he got to sit at her feet and learn from her. Let's conclude where we started. Daniel on the left would have 10 more years in his prison sentence if he hadn't come to a place about truth and love if God hadn't set things in motion far in advance so that an opportunity would be ready at the time that he was ready to do something different with his life. Tori was on the streets for 20 years as a junkie, and the two of them got into a relationship and just two weeks ago, this Sunday, got married, and I had the privilege of performing that ceremony for them. These were her bridesmaids, all, all uh, graduates of the Other Side Academy. I asked them, how many of you knew each other before you came to the Other Side Academy? They looked back and forth and they said, only by reputation. <laughs> and none of it good. Salvation is individual, but exaltation is collective. It's communal. That's what God wants us to achieve. Our, our primary mission is not individual salvation. In fact, when you feel the most despair, it's usually because you're obsessing about trying to fix a single person. When that happens, step back and get involved in the larger picture. Get involved in the war if you can't fight the battle that you want. When you do, you become part of God's work. Thank you.